And then, yep, this webinar is being live streamed. Uh, got it. Okay. And let's, uh, let's start. Okay. Awesome. Okay, very cool. Um, so let's give it a chance. I know we put uh, we put it out. See, uh, see who comes in. Um, oh, here we go. Here come some attendees. Very cool. Welcome, Tracy Ann. <laughs> um, and give it a few more minutes. It's um, let me see. Hold on. Oh. Hey, nice to see you. Nice to see you, Kate. Welcome, welcome. Hello. We're um, going, yeah. Um, oh, we're gonna get so we're gonna get going in just about a second. I am just uh, making sure we're all set up here. Um, and yeah. All right. Well. No time, no time like the present. Um, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to Syosset Libraries. Um, man, I like I do this all the time. Every time we do this, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna start this off like it's a podcast, but it's not a podcast. So um, yeah. Um, hello everybody. My name is Jessica from Syosset Library. I am the Community Engagement Specialist um, and my co-host today is... Jen. Hi, I'm a library aide in Media and Programming. And uh, we want to welcome you virtually to Syosset Public Library, Syosset, New York, on Long Island. Um, that is the library behind me. Um, but I'm not outside because it's pretty disgusting out where, um, where we are right now, which is great because we're here to uh, chat with author N.E. Davenport about The Blood Trials, which was a fabulous book. Um, thank you, so thank just you. A, a few things before we get going. Um, first of all, I already did our welcome to the library. Um, so now just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, this is a fun, friendly event. We are here to talk about this awesome book, The Blood Trials, and um, do some Q&A and uh, just, you know, a friendly banter is encouraged. However, um, any semblance of hate speech, racism, abusive language will have you booted from this virtual meeting, which is not why we're here. It would be a shame because you would be missing the awesomeness that is an E. Davenport and the blood trials. So that said, um, now that we all uh, know that we're going to conduct ourselves admirably, um, welcome any Davenport to Syosset Library. Um, Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Oh, a few more things. Um, really quickly, this event is also in webinar mode, which means that uh, your hosts and our author are the only people who will be sharing screen and um, mic. However, as I mentioned, we do encourage audience participation. So if you have questions or comments, um, we do ask that you drop them in the Q&A in the chat and Jen and or myself will address them to um, the author. So, okay, I'm done. It's all you now. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. I'm Annie Davenport. My debut adult science fantasy is called The Blood Trials. Um, we'll talk about it more in a bit, I guess, but it's basically a story um, about a black woman who she finds out her grandfather is murdered, so she throws her life to these deadly military trials in order to attain the rank necessary to bring his killers to um, justice. And because she's a woman and she's black and she's going through these military trials, she she hits up against extreme racism and misogyny uh, along the way. Um, and just to you know make it extra fun, she's also dealing with some illegal blood magic she's not supposed to possess. <laughs> Yeah, that's a pretty good summation of it. It was, um, it was a lot. It was, it was a pretty good <laughs> read. It was a lot of fun to read. Um, so, uh, Jen, did you have any any way uh, you wanted to get us started? And again, audience, please, Q and A is a hundred percent encouraged. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I love this book so much. I thought it was so much fun. The characters are all really great and engaging and they're all like real and complex and, you know, like complicated. And I wanted to talk, um, if, I wonder if we could start by talking a little bit about our main character, Ikenna, who is uh, like a, an amazing protagonist. Like she is, you know, dealing with like a lot of grief over the loss of her grandfather. And she's also dealing with these super, super intense trials and trying to find her way through this system with all of its like um, challenges. And I'm wondering like, um, how did you, how did you come up with the Kenna? Like what went into, you know, building her personality and how she interacts with her world and her friends and all that? <laughs> um, I think a lot of things, I think I took like real life inspirations and challenges and um, kind of mixed them together with some of my like favorite like science fiction fantasy protagonists um, that are in existence all, already um her identity and i guess her personal like struggles really came from me wanting to explore how black women in the real world have to navigate through you know professional settings and their goals and ambitions and how we're constantly having to work with this um burden of needing to be twice or three times sometimes you know quadruple as good um as our counterparts in order just to receive the same level or sometimes even have the recognition um, that our incredibly hard work ethic, um, you know, and grit, you know, you know, should, you know, we should get just from our work ethic. Um, so that's, that's what laid the foundation for Akina's character. Um, but I'm also a really big Star Wars fan. I'm a really big Black Panther fan. Um, if you've ever read Kate, um, it, um, the Kate Daniels books written by Ilona, Andrews, um, that character I've, I've always ad admired since maybe like my 20s, how she's very fierce, she's very confident in who she is, um, she's very like in your face and like brash and she's like, listen, I know, I know my worth, I know my strengths, I know my skills, um, she, I call it major like fight me in energy, she's like, you know, <laughs> I'm not putting up with the disrespect. Um, so I, I kind of blended that into a, those aspects into Akenna's character too. Um, and I just really wanted her to be a woman who knows her worth and knows her value um, and knows her strengths from the very beginning. Um, even erring on the side of brash and on the side of cocky um, and her not necessarily going through the world you you know thinking that she's less than but her navigating through this incredibly racist and sexist world knowing 1000 percent that she's phenomenal and basically having a goal of i'm going to make everybody else recognize this too, and bow down to the fact that that i am while also learning that the arrogance is a little bit of a character flaw too like she makes some very brash decisions um throughout the book that she pays heavily for as far as you know like the people and things that she holds dear, um, like I guess the, become collateral damage in some form or fashion um, because she's very much the type of character. Um, I call her my Arya Star type character. She like stabs first and then, you know, asks all the important questions later. And sometimes she pays for that fall. Awesome. And um, so we have so many questions coming in from the audience. I'm excited. And like, I have to say, I just realized, like, it's pretty cool that we're having this conversation uh, today that, um, yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. Jackson was just confirmed to the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court. And when you're talking about how I kind of, you know, was, um, you know, she, she knows that she's great, but she has to work four times as hard as everybody else. I'm like, li listening to this, I'm like, oh yeah, this is like a really great day to be doing this yes, audience, yes. <laughs> this chat. So um, with that said, let's, uh, so, so Daphne would like to know um, if you've read a lot of Octavia Butler and I believe there was one other comment and have you seen the movie Something New? I have not seen the movie Something New, but um, I have read a lot of Octavia Butler. My absolute favorite one is Fledgling because I'm a huge vampire nerd and my science fantasy, I'm guilty as charged. But um, I think Fledgling took the concept of vampires and turned it on its head and subverted it in a way that did something really ph phenomenal with the trope. 
Um, yeah, no, definitely. Um, I so I want to I want to address the audience questions before we continue with our own. Um, okay. Let's see. Hello, thank you for sharing today. Do you find yourself starting with a story first and growing the character, or um, for you, or as you go, or hang on, hang on, scrolling down, um, knowing your character first and placing them, uh, fitting the story as it emerges. It depends on the project. Sometimes it's story first, sometimes it's character first, sometimes bits and pieces of story and character come to me at the same time. I think for the blood trials, a character sprang to life fully formed, um, but also the world, the highly military, you know, strictly stratified world, you know, kind of sprang to life alongside her fully formed um, and then as I wrote the story both her character and the world she lived in were kind of fleshed out more. I really found the world so interesting and just like this um, it, you know it was a really good uh, expansion on like the um, the Roman adjacent type society I um, you know like it's it, it's very clear that you know there's that it's inspired by that but it was just done in a way that I've never seen before um, were you, what what parts of that inspired you <laughs> and um, I can't wait to see where it goes next. Yeah, okay, so I don't think it's a secret that I'm a really huge like Greek mythology and Roman mythology and just, you know, going away from mythology just like Greek and Roman history fan. Um, 300 is one of my favorite movies ever. Um, and um, The Ember in the Ashes is one of my favorite books ever. So I definitely, it was intentional to start with like a world that felt like it could be like Roman-esque in nature. Um, but then I really wanted to put this black protagonist in the world. So then it kind of started to evolve and grow into a society all that was all its own, um, trying to figure out why is this black woman here? Why is she, you know, in this fantasy world with so much racism and so much sexism? So why, why, why is her gender important and why is her race important too? And how do they, you know, interplay with each other? Um, and that's how just the highly stratified society evolved. That's how um, the incredibly backward ways of thinking as far as women and femme individuals e evolved. Um, and that's how the fact that Marine is a society that pays an incredible amount of importance to legacy and lineage and this like completely like antiquated idea of like purity, um, which we all know is like complete BS. But that's how those elements that made the society what it is evolved. Um, and then Akina just being who she is, she's never going to accept a society telling her that she's less than um, according to traits that have nothing to do with, you know, the actual, you know, measurable things as far as like her strength and her skills and her intelligence and her work ethic. Um, and so then she is the type of protagonist that really pokes holes in the indoctrinations and the, you know, toxicity of the society, not just for herself, the people who look like her, but for everybody involved in the society, even those who don't. Um, along the way, we see her and, you know, her on ensemble cast really starting to say, really starting to say, um, this, this type of thinking is just harmful for everybody across the board. Um, and that's how we, you know, get on this like path of like, is it time for a rebellion? Maybe it is. <laughs> I see we haven't, oh, go ahead, Jen. Oh, I was just gonna ask the question. We have another one from the audience. Um, <clears throat> did you research character names or did you make them up? Do they ha hold any meaning? And I really like that question. That's really good. <laughs> um, I feel like it was a little bit uh, um, half and half. Um, I researched Akina's name and honestly, her, her name has a meaning that means father's power. Um, and without giving, you know, um, too much of a spoiler, it meant one thing in an earlier draft, but then that plot trope, um, I mean, sorry, that, uh, like, that plot line, it kind of got cut, 
but then her close relationship with her grandfather um, and how he really sets her up to be, you know, the future of his legacy and and their family. I think her name still carries, you know, an incredible significance to the book. Uh, we actually, that's a really good segue into the next question. Um, did you know who done it before he started writing, meaning Vern's <laughs> actual killer? Um, I did not know who did it before I started writing. Well, actually, that's not true. Um, I had an idea of who did it. And then as I started writing, um, it, I, like, I kind of like had a different idea and then, um, once we went into edit, my my fantastic editor, who is so brilliant, um, threw out another idea for, hey, what? why don't we try this and see how this plays? And it was one of those light bulb moments. And I was like, this is brilliant. And this is um, gonna play really fantastic if we incorporate this person being the killer in like the end. So yeah, it evolved along the way from draft to revision. I was, um, I know that you're spotlighted, but um, <laughs> Jen can see, cause she can see me and you can see, I made the mind blown so long. <laughs> yeah. Because I was, wow, yeah, that it, it's, um, I mean, that's like one of the things I love about the book. It's, um, you know, it's like a great blend of fantasy and science fiction. Um, and, you know, like it's got an amazing uh, protagonist and I love, you know, like all this stuff when you say that um, Kenna has um, like fight mode, like she's always like fight and fight me mode, like, you know, it really, it, it really comes, it, it, that's who she is. And it is like, it, it is like both a strength and a flaw. And, you know, she's kind of trying to figure that out as it goes on. but. It's also a bit of a mystery, you know, like mm -hmm. you, you, so her, her grandfather um, was a really high ranking member of the society. He was the highest, right? Yes. And um, she, Kenna was, um, Kenna was like her, his, his legacy. And, um, you know, like there were people who resented Vern because of, you know, because he was black, because of his lineage. Um, but really, he was like the, you know, you couldn't deny what he, <laughs> yeah. he was. Yeah. So it was almost infuriating to the people who, like, they were like, er, yeah, well, you know, like we owe him. We're just not going to like it. But <laughs> I mean, I, I, not, not for nothing, but like, that's just like what these people yeah. come up as. Um, but at the same time, you know, like you, you had that mystery of, okay, so first I kind of thinks that he's, he died because of like some sort of, you know, other issue, but then, um, his best friend presents, well, I think he was murdered. So there's a murder mystery going on there. Um, are you like are are you yourself like a fan of murder mysteries as well? <laughs> so I'm a fan of murder mysteries when they're in, I'm a huge lover of urban fantasy. I, I feel like I cut my science fiction fantasy teeth <clears throat> probably on urban fantasy and paranormal romance. And I feel like murder mysteries are sometimes like a really huge thing that both of those uh genres will play with. Um, so I think I just, I just naturally wrote in a murder mystery because that's what I'm so used to like devouring in the um, science fiction fantasy books that I've read for forever. Um, but it's funny because I, I'd never written one before the blood trials. And I remember when I got edits back, that was one of the things that my editor was, was like, we need to, you know, strengthen this um, and really like give the reader something that they can sink their teeth into as far as this mystery and like play along with the who um, done it and it was it might have been one of the most hardest and difficult parts to get right and I remember like emailing my agent at one point and being like okay if I ever have an idea and put a murder mystery in the idea again tell me no <laughs> I was like, don't do that um but you know it took a lot of hard work and a lot of like um, invaluable like for, for like beta readers and critiques 
partners. Um, and then finally, um, I got the murder mystery to like a spot where I felt really good about it. And I felt like it was really strong. Um, yeah. <laughs> We have some more questions from the audience. <clears throat> uh, this uh, question asker says, when writing my current work, I really struggled with finding my narrator tone and voice. How do you approach that for something new? Okay, so a writer friend just gave me this really good advice and I think it's phenomenal. And he basically said, if you have an actress or an actor in mind, that would be great for the part. Um, literally write the dialogue in their voice, if if if, if like that makes sense. Um, and for some things, it works. Like I'll start off with a character, and I'm like, this uh, actor or actress that plays this part in this movie would be perfect. Um, and so then I'll you know write their voice exactly in like in their lines exactly how they would deliver it if they were you know the lead in the story. Um, but then other times it's um, I can't really pinpoint a specific real life person to drop in there as I'm writing. And so then I just think about what are, what are their individual like quirks and sayings and turns of phrases? What are some things that are unique to like that only they would say or that they would observe or like notice? Like, for example, um, I feel like if a kind of like walks into a room, she's not necessarily gonna be like, um oh like paying attention to things like garb and like dresses and like um like I guess the social connections between folks she's gonna she's she she was trained to be a soldier so when she walked into a room um the little details that she would observe would be you know what are the entry points and what are the exit points and who are like what what are the alliances here and um, who could be against me and wh what are the threats here? And so it's really about getting inside, I think, your character's head and knowing the things they'll see and describe to their readers, the things they'll gloss over because it's just not important to your character. Um, and then just knowing the language and like the terms of phrases that they would use to speak to the people in their world and to the reader. That's great. Um, we have another question. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, hang on. I'm having trouble scrolling for some reason. Oh, how did you figure out what the trials would consist of? And also, how did you knit, begin to knit together the mythology of Marine? You mentioned you're a big fan of mythology yourself. Did you struggle with creating your own? Um, so I believe I was watching the first season of the magicians while I was drafting. Um, so one trial definitely came drew inspiration from the Madrid from the magicians. I think there was this one scene where um like the new freshmen um they were being hazed and they like dropped them in like the middle of like this forest or something. Um, and so then that's where the actual setting of a forest sprang up. But then I was like, oh this it, it would be cool if like this forest was drenched in magic and it wasn't like a whimsical, like fun, like benign forest, but it was like a malevolent force that kind of, you know, took on a life, a vicious life of its own and had like monsters lurking um, about. Um, so yeah, so that was the inspiration for that one trial. I'm like trying to like talk and like give the inspiration about like giving like spoilers about what the trials actually are, or like what they're gonna bump up against. Um, but it was basically just me asking myself, what is the most horrific threat, like terrifying thing that I can um, drop drop my characters into um, and literally put them through hell and be like, this is testing your metal um, and, you know, your combat skills to see if you're quote unquote worthy, um, you know, to come through on the other side whole. Um, there was one, um, well, I feel like, well, that's kind of a spoiler, but there's the very last trial at the end, um, it deals with coldness, it deals with a lot of ice. Um, I did a lot of research um, for that one. Um, and as far as mythology goes, um, I really like mythology, but I feel like I've also been like spinning my own tales as I've been like probably curious, like as there's, story that my family always tell, I 
tells. I was like three and didn't even like read yet. And my grandmother, she was a teacher um, for 20 something odd years before she retired. And this was like old school where like teachers would like have an actual lesson plan book, right? Um, and they'd like write in it. So I was sitting beside her at the living room table um, and I had a sheet of paper and was just like scribbling in it. Um, and she asked me, you know, what, what are you writing? I told her a story. And while there was no actual letters on the page, I told her an entire story, beginning, middle and end. And then you could go back and recite what those scribbles were supposed to mean. Um, so yeah, I've always had a very vivid, very active imagination. So a lot of the mythology, um, I started off thinking about how I really like how um, like the Greek gods are comprised of this pantheon that's not they're pretty terrible and they are pretty vicious and they are extremely petty um and they're not actually just people that you want to meet in real life um so i definitely wanted my pantheon of gods to embody you know those petty that petty vicious god energy um and then i just thought about um you know obviously the great I don't think off the top of my head, I don't think they have like a god of like blood, right? So I'm like, again, it has blood magic. So I'm like, there needs to be a god or goddess that holds problems over these blood rights. And that's how, you know, one of the gods came about. And in the society that she grows up in, they are really, um, they're a very warring type society. And I'm like, so it's only natural that how they got created was, you know, the mythology of the blood trials is that the, the planet that is set on was created by these vicious gods um long long like thousands and thousands and thousands of years back and that each of the current civilizations that exist are leftover peoples that the gods themselves you know forged and formed into um you know their own worshipers and so the society um marine that it kind of grows grows up in they um, are heavily geared towards combat and war and raising up these soldiers. And it's because the God that founded that society is the literal God of war. Um, and so there are people who come from a legacy who were literally created um, and formed by, by a God to be his soldier. Jen, do you want to take the next question? If you have it, perfectly into that. Absolutely. Um, Allison asks, did you have any input into the cover art? Oh, I'm sorry, Allison. I, I missed that. It's Kate's question that leads perfectly into it, but we can take a little detail. Oh gosh, I missed that. one. I'm so no, sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> it, um, yeah, it's totally cool. Go okay. Ahead. Yeah, no. So, yes, I was fortunate that I had tons of input into the cover art. My editor emailed me at the very beginning of like you thinking as far as this cover. Um, I was like, okay, I don't know how much like input I should give. Should I just like go for broke and be like, here's my list of ones? <laughs> or should I try to be like more like low key and reserved? Um, but then I just ended up, you know, airing on the side of dumping a list of request and I was like I would really like a black girl on the cover because I think that's huge to have that representation um because we don't get it a ton we don't get it enough in science fiction fantasy and I'm like this like the blue knife that she has on the cover is a very it, like intricate part of the plot so I was like it'd be cool if she could have that and some kind of way we can get her blood and magic in there um basically everything I asked for as a request my publisher and the um artists that we worked with were phenomenal about taking my vision and um, returning like an incredibly gorgeous cover. Um, I also have a question from Kate. How do you, and this is actually good because I was curious about this as well. How do you see the blood gift and how did you develop the magic from the magic component of the story? What previous stories about magic inspired you? How do I see it as far as like where it sits on like the morality spectrum or how do I see it as far as like, I'll just ask, I guess I'll answer it in both ways. So how, I, I see like it as like it's a magic that is not inherently good or bad. Like yes, it can be like wielded for evil and yes, it can be deadly. Um, but so can like, you know, the man-made weapons of the real world and of the kind of world. Um, so if you're asking about it on like where, like where do I see it on like the morality spectrum? To me, it's like it's 
it just exists. Um, and it's the wielder who can either, you know, be, you know, a villain or like a hero of like the story and of this mad magic. And I think that's one of the things that I can uh, grapple with throughout book one. And then I lean more heavily into it in book two. Um, you have this incredibly powerful and deadly gift. And it's that, um, I'm probably saying this because I just watched Spider-Man No Way Home last night. But it's that, <laughs> but it's that age old like adage that, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Or, you know, another way we say it is that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So that's definitely a question that book one and then book two dives into when you have um, a staggering power that skews even lethal at your disposal does mere virtue of possessing it make you one of the bad guys um or is it more so how you use it and how you wield it and what you do with it and I think that's a question that um again this isn't a spoiler because I feel like it's on the cover but um yeah so Marie so Akina grows up in a society that has you know persecuted all of its magic users so on top of you know hitting up against racism and sexism she's also hitting up against the fact that if anyone finds out she has this magic, she'll be hated and killed too. Um, because that society sees magic as being, you know, an, an, an abomination that could, you know, topple what's left of the world that has kind of like re-risen and like rebuilt itself um, after these terrible gods um, were like kicked out. Um, so she's grappling with that destiny and with that lineage as like, well, um, but she's not our villain. She's our protagonist. And so we definitely explore the question that you can be a hero while still possessing, you know, magic that, you know, could cause catastrophe. Um, it's just what you choose to do with it and how you choose to look. I think that was like a second part of that question question but I'm sorry I don't remember so if we can reread the second part what previous stories about magic inspired you? okay um Star Wars definitely I really like the way that like the force is like this mystical thing that gets combined with the science fiction and like incredibly and technologically advanced uh, um, society um Kate Daniels, um, Il Ilona Andrews is Kate Daniels' book, for sure. Blood Magic is one of the major magics um, that gets um, deployed in that book. Um, Avatar The Last Airbender, I loved that since I was like 12, I think. Um, and um, there's like, bloodbending is like a little bit of like an offset of like, you know, one of the four bending elements um but just that magical system of like you know the water bending and earth bending and fire bending and air bending and like you know different magical gifts um that exist within that span of planet um and that whole cultures have grown up around and how the magical gifts um are intricately linked to the society and you know the culture that bears them um that was definitely an inspiration i'm trying to think of all you know the things and ember in the ashes um was an inspiration not for the magic itself but again for how like this one empire um that's very you know martial leaning comes through and swallows up the rest of the world except in the blood trials the empire isn't you know who's already done the conquering it's this um foreign land across the ocean who tried to conquer uh, the continent that Marine sits on once. And that's why again, his grandfather is this huge war hero that he's untouchable. And even though, you know, the people begrudge that he's risen to the highest rank, they kind of just have to swallow it and accept it because he literally saved an entire continent but from being conquered. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the blood trial comes from the point of view of Akina is existing within a land that fought off the conquerors once. And as her story evolves, there's an underlying question of, are they gonna come back? When will they come back? Are we gonna be ready for them? And you know, who's gonna be the hero of our generation if we've lost you know, the one who saved us before? 
I love all of that. And I love that you're an Avatar fan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Jen, do you want to take the next question? Sure. Um, have you ever been part of a writing group? Do you find any benefit to that sort of close group support when writing? Yeah, I'm part of two really close ones um, now, and I feel like they are a group that I've been a part of. One, one I've been a part of since the beginning of my writing journey. The second I've been a part of since maybe like a year or two into my writing journey, um, but that's even been um, years now. And they've really evolved, and both groups have really evolved into like my main support system. Um, my main critique partners and beta readers um, when I'm like down on myself or when I'm like just you know spiraling I'm like oh my god I can't do this this or this is never going to sell or I can't do what this story needs um, they're definitely my core group of people I go to um, when I'm hitting rock bottom to like lift me up and be like you got this you can do this um, and they always see the vision and how it's how I'm capable of making it come together before I'm able to see it. Um, so I definitely recommend um, either writing groups or just, you know, writing friends. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a formal group. Um, because even like I, I, I can talk about stories and publishing challenges with with like my family and they're always good to listen and for support but they're also not going through it so they don't like get it on like the level of dude i feel you and i'm commiserating with which you were in this cell together um and so that's just what i've found really invaluable about my writing groups there are people that i can like complain to i can whine to i can cry to i can laugh with and it's like we're all on this like one big little camping trip together um and just trying to like reach for the dream whatever that looks like for each of us allison wants to know um why a duology are you sure two books That's all you need. <laughs> Actually, no, I would, um, it's a duology. When I first wrote a kind of story, I conceived it as a trilogy. Um, my publisher offered on it as a duology, but if you love the blood trial, buy a copy, convince all of your friends and all of your family to buy a copy. So hopefully it can become a trilogy. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I've been seeing duology is like a big thing lately. Um, you know, a lot of um, a lot of authors seem to be going that route, but I but it is good to know that um, because it seems like such an expansive world. There's like so much, and I yeah, I found myself too being like, man, I I would read more about like you know just more parts of this. From what I've gathered is from conversations with my agent, publishing as like a larger structure has decided that standalones and duologies are like the future and like, you know, trilogies and like beyond, not so much. So they're starting to shift, I think. But also that I feel like, and this is just my perspective and like opinion, that's totally dependent on sales. I think, I think we see duologies all the time that, you know, the book one sells well and then, you know, um, they become trilogies or four or five or six book things. So I think just I, like publishing is fickle. It just all depends. Oh, but yes, I would love to make it like a three, four book series. Um, it's a huge world, and um, even book two, it give. I turned into the first draft in February, and it gives you closure. But also, I've definitely already set it up for Akina to like go on this phenomenal brand new journey that I think. Um, people who follow her and people who love her would really be into it. I have a question about um, writing multiple books in a series that I've always kind of wondered about. Um, when you're writing something that you know is gonna take more than one book to tell, is it hard to balance like um, the need to have like a sense of closure in one book while also setting up stuff for later books? like? Like, does that make sense? Like to give the book its yeah. own, but also be part of a bigger arc, you know? Yeah, that's actually something I had to learn to do as, as the, so The Blush House is my first book that was published. Um, and it's something that I learned to do in revisions because the um, draft that went on sub and that and, and that got, got bought, it was definitely one of those like cliffhanger in, 
endings that gave no closure at the at the end. Um, and so in revisions, um, in, I, I had to work to create an arc that felt like you got a full story within book one, even while, you know, leaving things open for, you know, the rest of the journey to continue in book two. And I think it's something that um, TV does, does a really good job of like when we um not this last season because it was terrible but game of thrones for one um not the very final season but you know all the seasons that came before that um those types of shows i think from when you study it from a tv and film perspective they do a really good job of like giving you a, a complete arc um in like one series um or one season but also like setting things up to be like, oh, but I really need the next season because even though we just dealt with all of this stuff in this season and got our closure, now I need to know, you know, what's about to occur with all this new stuff that we, you know, you know, wedged the can off of. And now I'm like, I want to see all the more like pop off and all the drama just unfold. <laughs> Yeah, I was actually just thinking there's a there's a show that that Netflix just canceled after one season and I know Jen's watched it too and I am so sad because I need to know what happens next. But it's based on a podcast so maybe I can just watch the listen to the podcast uh, uh, archive 80 was it archive 81. Oh, that's on my list of why oh, it's so good. <laughs> so good. Just, just Arcane, be, yeah. yeah. Just, just, I was just gonna say, just be language. aware that. I'm sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I just read that, and it made me really sad. I'm still gonna watch it, but I'm like, this sounds so good. But Arcane League of Legends on Netflix does a really good job of giving you a complete arc, um, and like a complete story within that first season. Um, but then also like it sets up a brand new conflict for season two, um, that I'm so excited about, and I cannot wait until we get season two delivered to our TV. Raising Dion, I'm sorry, I just saw Daphne. Yes, I have, and I love Raising Dion, and that is another show that does a phenomenal job of giving you a complete arc in this first season, and then, um, but it sets up like a bigger journey in season two. And one thing I learned is, um, so you 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 give a big bad or like your main villain in book one, while also laying a plot for like a larger villain that's kind of lurking in the background. Um, and so then, you know, book one, a good way to tackle it is, is book one addresses the immediate villain or the immediate big bad. And then, you know, by the time you get to the end, the one that's looming in the, in the background has now surged to the forefront. And so then book two is, is, is kind of nicely and organically set up to tackle that looming threat that's now at the doorstep. Um, Daphne also wants to know, do you have a set method for revision at, um, and do you find yourself changing a lot of settings and characters in the setting or scenes? Um, I don't have a set method for revisions. Um, normally my characters and my settings and my scenes um, are pretty, so I have really solid concepts of those from the first draft stage. My revisions normally look like me going through and um, like fine tuning dialogue and like fleshing out world building details um, and like um, adding in like important backstories for like the characters and like the conflict and the world itself. Um, I kind of, I loosely use the or three or four act structure depending on the novel. I don't use it to draft on the huge pen, so I sit down and start the thing. Um, but when I get ready to revise, I will um, type up like a summary of every chapter and then I will compare the pacing um, and the beats against like the three act or four act structure. And normally it pretty nicely naturally uh, aligns, but as I'm revising, I'll go through um with an eye towards making sure you know my story is hitting the you know the progression of the three x structure or the four x structure if that's what i'm using there's an earlier question that we missed from uh allison um when can we expect book two is it named yet <laughs> It is named Jet. I don't know if I can say what the name is, even though the name is like really, really obvious. 
<laughs> um, it's super obvious, so I don't know if it's a secret or not, but it is named. Um, I turned in the first draft of it February 1. My, um, I'm anxiously and very nervously awaiting editorial notes back on it. Um, but yeah, I um, don't know if I can say when we can expect it yet because my publisher has not given me the green light to say that either. But I can say that because they kind of um, like announced this widely too. Um, I'm a part for Voyager and, you know, they have, you know, they're, they're serving a lot of duologies right now. And the model they seem to be serving them under is that you're going to get this incredibly powerful um, tight knit, like quick paced story um, coming out, you know, you're going to go on a full journey between book one and book two within the span of like a year ish. Um, so it won't be two years out. It probably won't even be like 18 months out. It'll probably be closer to like right at like next winter ish, but I don't know for sure yet. <laughs> Um, someone wants to know, speaking of Netflix and other formats, do you listen to audiobooks? How about your own stories? Do you prefer voice <laughs> over written for certain stories? Um, I listen to actually all of them. Um, I thought I was the only one and I was just on, I was just being extra because normally when I buy a book and really like it, I have it in a physical copy. I have an ebook and I have an audiobook because I don't have a pref preference, but when I'm looking to read and like also study craft as I'm reading I like to um use an ebook on um or like the physical book um but also when I'm looking to like re relax and be able to do other things or other tasks while I'm reading then an audiobook is really good for that normally um I have a really long commute um I have my oldest daughter she goes to school like an hour away in the city um so I use audiobooks for like my drives or when am I doing chores around the house um and that way I can like listen to them and be engaged with without missing something um when I'm not you know driving or doing chores and I normally prefer to read either the ebook or the physical book I don't really have a preference for that sometimes uh ebook is easier because I have little babies too and so when I have the physical book they like to like grab it out of my hand um so an ebook is just it's easier to like hold the book and like deal with the babies at the same time um i do have a book that i really prefer on audiobook um it's a mg or a middle grade fantasy it's called miss Wood school for magic and the soundtrack the actual audiobook um it has a live orchestra because the magic is based on like these um these kids playing these musical instruments so it has like a live orchestra that records you know the magical spells as like songs as like you know you see you're listening to the dialogue and the narration um so that's really cool and i'd like i'd love to find like more books that give me like those live really cool like bands or orchestras too um then i totally prefer audiobook for that Uh, we have another question in the chat, but we also just got one in the Q&A, which I'll grab, and then Jen will take the chat. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, okay, um, let's see. Um, Tracy Ann would like to know, what are you currently reading? What is a book <laughs> you are looking forward to coming out this year? Okay. Um, what am I currently reading? Um, I just most recently finished a YA rom-com called Charming as a verb that was delightful on the science fiction fantasy in the most recent um book I finished reading I always get this question and like it oozes out of my brain but the unbroken by C.L. Clark is a phenomenal read that I um most recently finished reading books coming out this year that I'm most looking forward to and I, my timeline may be a little iffy but I think they're all coming out this year but um Kaylin Bayron's This Wicked Fate, which is a follow-up to This Poison Heart. Um, Tracy Dion's Bloodmark, which is a follow-up to the phenomenal Legendborn. The Unbroken is getting its book too, I believe, um, that's coming out this year. Babel by R.F. Huang is one I'm like totally like, I need this book right now. Um, book of Night by ha Holly Black. I'm incredibly ready for that book to be in my hands. And The Last Strife, I'm ready for it that fantasy too. 
very nice. Um, so another question um, for sci-fi, do you find it easier to write early mornings or late night? Um, it's easier for me to write early morning because I feel like I'm refreshed my, um, like all the neurons are firing, like peak, like what, 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 whatever makes the creativity juices like fire on all cylinders and like go full steam ahead. I feel like I'm at the top of my game, like early mornings. Um, if I try to write at night after like a full day of, you know, work stuff and like parenting stuff and family stuff, I'm extremely exhausted and I find that whatever I attempt to write is complete trash and I just have to go and stick to the next day anyway. <laughs> I was wondering if we could maybe talk a little bit more about the way that uh, magic works in the world because something that I thought was super interesting was that like magic doesn't really have the same status like everywhere in this world like there are countries where it is used and embraced to a certain extent and like those like, places are still like in touch with the gods and then there's like marine where magic has basically been like cast out from society and stuff like that so i'm wondering like how you landed on like the way that like you know different societies relate to magic yeah, so magic is this thing that was definitely created and handed down by the gods to not everybody, but just like this certain chosen special few. Um, and so the way magic, you, you, you speed up to this planet that realized the gods were terrible and kicked them off, um, you now have, but the magic didn't leave when the gods left. So the magic still persists and people with the magic that was gifted because the magic works in a biological way where like it's handed down like in the genes from like one magic bearer to another. Um, and so you have this magic that still exists even though the gods are gone. And so it really depends on how each society feels about the things left over from the gods. Like if, you know, anything having to do with the gods is just an abomination, which is how the society that Kenna grows up in still, so they don't even really pay much attention to, they even shun like the lore and the mythology and like any like history having to do or relating to the gods. Um, and they've hunted, you know, the current magic wilders in their society to extinction um, because it's fueled by hatred, but it's also fueled by fear them um, really coming to embrace a belief that technological advancement um is better than magic um and wanting to like divorce themselves from anything having to do with magic for fear that it'll corrupt their society or you know drag it back into these former like terrible ages whereas you have a neighboring kingdom that they're they don't really they recognize that the gods were bad, but the, their patron goddess was one of the benevolent ones among the terrible pantheon. So they don't necessarily feel the same disdainful way about magic as a, as like a kind of con, con, country does. And so they are more readily accepting um, of magic users. I mean, they're not like embracing it wholeheartedly and they're like, oh, we love it but they're also like, we're not gonna murder everybody who maybe possesses a kernel of magic or shun anything magical. Um, and then you also have this like, this, like I, I was talking about the enemy would be conquerors. Um, they are a nation um, and they happen to be the ones that bear the same magical blood gift as, as Akina, which is why she will absolutely be killed if people find out she has it. Um, but they, um, they understand the gods were terrible, but they don't necessarily think that the gifts they left behind were terrible. So they even still pay homage to the gods and revere the gods in some fashion. Um, and they very much wholeheartedly embrace, you know, the magic and the magical gifts. And um, there's not only magical gifts, but there's magical places. Um, if you read the Blood Child and then book two that was left behind by the gods too. So they wholeheartedly embrace it and they realize the strength um, that that can afford a person. And they leverage that versus like a kind of society leverages war tech to their advancement. Um, but 
the Society of Blood Magic users, they leverage, you know, magical gifts and magical strengths to their um, advantage. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I had a question, but one popped up and I'm going to get, I'm going to let this question come. Did you world build the story first or did you begin with a character and gradually uncolor, uh, gosh, uncover the elements of the story? So I, so the very first thing I begun with was I, um, uh, right at the start of the pandemic, I stopped teaching because they um, wanted us all to go back to work and I was pregnant. Um, but I used to teach and I used to teach English and Othello is a read that was, is, was my favorite Shakespeare read to, to like teach. And I've talked about this a lot, but depending on how you interpret it, you can absolutely read Othello as a black man or at the very least a dark skinned man who's in this society um, where he's a ethnic minority, but he's also won all these wars and he's a general and He's in his position of power, even if some people like Iago just hate him for it. So I started off um, with that idea simmering in the back of my mind and asking myself, what if there was a story um, with that dynamic? But it's not actually about this Othello figure itself. But Verna Mori was very much from the beginning written to be an Othello type figure. Um, but what if the story isn't about this Othello type figure or Verna Mori in the Kenneth world? What if, what if he has his grandfather, I mean, this, like his granddaughter, who he raises in his image and in his le legacy to overcome the barriers that he bumped up against? Um, because even though he's the highest ranking member, um, Akina's grandfather never truly manages to get a full seat at the table, if that makes sense. Like, if we think about Obama, yes, Obama was president, but also Obama still hit up against an incredible amount of like hatred and bigotry and like racism and had, you know, so many initiatives like blocked along the way um, that, you know, he was, you know, trying to affect change for. So, Akina's grandfather is definitely in that same position. And Akina is, you know, the granddaughter that's born in his image with all of his strengths. Um, that that like he raises to surpass what he could do and you know to go above and beyond um so that figure and akenna came to me first um and the type of world they lived in came to me first and then just as i was working through the plot um the plot of like the trials and what the trials were and the gods and the different conflicts between the different nations, all of that kind of sprang up around who Akena and who her grandfather were and how they fit into the world. I love, love, love that you just brought up Othello <laughs> because it was itching in the back of my brain, like when I'm reading about it. And, you know, even when we were talking about it before about how these people were like, you know, I, I, I guess, I guess I should be grateful to him, but I'm still going <laughs> to be yeah. rude and obnoxious and I'm still mm -hmm. going to give you trouble. It, it didn't strike me until you just said it. And I'm like, oh yes, there it is. There's that like classical comparison. Um, one more thing, um, your main, so someone says your, uh, your main character reminds me a lot of Captain Burnham. Um, have you ever watched Star Trek Discovery? I have not, but I need to because you are like the twelfth person who has who has said something about Star Trek Discovery, and clearly it needs to be pushed up to the top of my watch list. Before we go, and I texted this to Jen, and it's a silly question, but now that I know that you're a Star <laughs> Wars and and an Avatar fan, what what kind of bender do you think you would be, and what would your like? Saber be and wouldn't have dual blades. Okay, so I'm definitely a firebender. I feel like that used to be on my Twitter bio before I needed to shorten it. So I would absolutely be a firebender. Please don't shame me for that. <laughs> but like not, not when they were like, but not when they were like bad and ruled by the tyrant. I guess we would fast forward into the future where Zuko is finally good, right? And um he's like ushered them into like an age of, you know, enlightenment. So but I would definitely be a firebender because I just think it's cool to like be able to like literally like just shoot fire from like your fingertips, but right and just burn things down. And sometimes when things are corrupt, 
they need to be burnt down to, you know, be built back up into something that's not corrupt. So, uh, which is a pretty nice lead way into the Star Wars question because another low key, eh, questionable opinion, but I'm definitely like Team Dark Side versus like Team Jedi. <laughs> we get into like a different, like, like Star Wars faction. Um, I, and it's only because I'm a huge Darth Vader fan. I love Anakin's arc um, from, you know, the supposed chosen one to like this very slippery slope um, down like this like incredibly like disastrous path because, you know, he was making all the wrong decisions but for the right, you know, purpose. He was trying to save the love of his life. Um, and he just made like some terrible decisions all along the way, but I love Darth Vader um, and I love Anakin. So, um, and I've also, so if, let's see, if, if, if I was wielding a lightsaber, it would definitely be dual blood, blood, bladed because that just seems very cool. And it seems like you could like go into like stabby mode, like more efficiently and more effective, more effectively. Um, but if we're talking about colors, um, while red would like feel ominous, I would go for pink um because I'd be because pink is my favorite color but I'd be like yes it's pink but it's also dual bladed and I'm also about to carve you apart with this pink white thing <laughs> I was thinking in my mind I'm like it's got to be the color of her shirt because yes, yes, you, yes. Would, you should never mess with somebody who has a lightsaber <laughs> that color <laughs> I agree I agree Everybody, thank you so much for coming on behalf of Syosset Library. Um, check out the book at your library, buy it, get it wherever you get your books. And uh, thank you so, so much to M.E. Davenport. Um, uh, you're welcome. Um, tomorrow <laughs> at 12 noon Eastern time, we're doing a virtual lunch with um, V.E. Schwab to talk about Ooh. Gavin Burke. Yeah, come. You're welcome to. Yeah. Yes, yes. I I love Schwab. Like everything is Schwab right. I love it. So yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, maybe we'll see you then. Um, yes. And uh, I forgot to mention this was technically a BYOB. So if you are bringing whatever <laughs> beverage at home, um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, be it water or something else. I don't know. You go, yeah. ha, you, everyone do you and have fun. Um, so uh, once again, this was Jessica. Thank you so much from Syosset Library. And- um, Oh, and Jen. Jen. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, really nice um, talk to you. Yeah, and come back and talk about the next blood trials. Like it's yeah, yes, please. For sure, for sure. I'd love for you guys to have me back. Oh, Yay. All right, everybody have a wonderful night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.